I'm just going to get get going so we can um, get started with the good stuff. So hello everyone, welcome to another meeting of the Formal Demography Working Group. Um, it's great to see you all again. Uh, today we've got presentations about um, the formal demography of kinship. We've got two speakers, Diego and Howe, so I'll just do a brief intro. Um, so Diego Alvarez is a research scientist in the lab of digital and computational demography at MPIDR. He received his PhD in demography and population studies at London School of Economics. Um, Diego's research focuses on kinship processes and uh, combines a really unique perspective, drawing on both his um, background in anthropology and demography. His dissertation involved developing a genealogical approach to reconstruct populations after armed com conflicts. And um, he's really leading the way, I think, to think about how we combine different approaches to study kinship processes in terms of theory uh, and methods, and also thinking about new data sources, uh, including online genealogies. Uh, and then Hal Caswell is a professor of mathematical demography and ecology at the University of Amsterdam. His research focuses on matrix-based population models for human, plants, and animals. And some of his most recent work, uh, which is related to today, introduces matrix-based uh, models for estimating kinship structures. He's the author of many seminal books in demography, as most of the audience probably know, including matrix population models. And he's a co-author on the third edition of Applied Mathematical Demography with Nathan Kiefitz. Hal's work has been so influential for me um, and obviously for probably a lot of people in the audience um, to think about how we think about how uh, demographic methods are developed, taught and also applied. So I'm really excited to have both of you here. Thank you for uh, agreeing to present and I think Hal's going to start off. Okay, let's see. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, some recent work that I've been doing on the formal demography of kinship. And there's a series of papers uh, on this. Uh, before I go any further, let me ask for a thumbs up if you can hear me OK. OK, good. Um, there's a series of papers on this, which I'm going to put into the chat uh, as soon as everybody, apparently everybody needs to be here in order to be able to see stuff in the chat. So I'm going to put things into the chat so that you can have uh, references for some of the things that I talk about. Let me share my screen. This one. Okay, there we go. So, ah, before I forget, uh, I have uh, postdoc positions open for applying this theory that I'm going to talk about. And I will put information about that in the chat, but contact me if you are interested or have questions about that. So uh, first of all, uh, where do we start? So formal demography of kinship really started uh, in one sense with this paper from 1974. And I yes, so Tom Pullum, one of the authors of this paper is in the audience. So shout out to Tom. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> this, this paper was... Um, uh, important. It set out an approach to analyzing kinship that focused on a central individual and asked questions about uh, the kin, the number of relatives of different kinds that this person would have uh, at different ages. Uh, it was also difficult. Um, it, it essentially, I view it as a tour de force of multiple integration. It integrated over all the pathways by which somebody could get relatives of different kinds. Uh, the expression that I have on this slide is, 
is for uh, cousins um, whose mother is the younger sister of the mother of a girl aged A. And uh, even when I was working with Nathan Kiefitz on the third edition of his book, I found I the chapter in which he went through this uh, was, was very hard to follow. And so at some point, uh, what I do. Um, and the idea was uh, the, the ingredients uh, in the Goodman, Kiefitz, and Pullum approach were a mortality schedule and a fertility schedule. Uh, and so what I wanted to get was to get not just the numbers, but the age distributions and things that could be calculated from age distributions. And then because this is uh, something that matrices lend themselves to, uh, go beyond just classifying individuals by age and go on time invariant models and go beyond one sex models uh, and, um, and have a, a result that's easy to compute. It doesn't require you to do uh, lots of brute force simulations. So how do we do that? Let's, well, let's get the slides done. Yes, so this is focal. Um, the calculations are based, uh, they, they are relative to a focal individual. And I kept saying a focal individual enough that I actually decided that she had a name. It's kind of a composite uh, female or male of some specified age in a population with a specified mortality schedule and a specified fertility schedule. And the other piece of information you need is the distribution of the ages of mothers uh, at birth of children. And so uh, this becomes Focal's, uh, Focal has a name. We will refer to her often in what follows. Now, the insight that I had, which I, I'm absurdly proud of myself for having this insight. The kin of Focal of any particular kind that you want, cousins, aunts, nephews, are a population. This is a picture of the population of a bunch of my relatives. I'm hiding in the back row somewhere. This was at a family reunion a few years ago that we had. And so the kin of focal are population. And if the kin of focal are population, my thought was we might as well model them as one. Well, how do you do that? You do that like this. So let me, so this is notation that's going to appear throughout this. So X is the age of focal. This vector K is a generic kind of kin. There'll be different symbols for different uh, categories of relatives. Uh, and this is the age distribution vector of some kind of kin at age X of focal. There's a survival matrix. In the simplest case, this is a matrix with age-specific survival probabilities on the subdiagonal and zeros elsewhere. And beta of X, this is a vector that gives the recruitment of new kin of this type at age X. This is a what some places in ecology we call a subsidized population. That is, new recruits to some kind of kin don't come from the reproduction of those kin. They come from somewhere else. The reproduction of daughters doesn't produce more daughters. It produces granddaughters. So there's two possibilities. One, we'll see there's a zero. There's some categories that you don't get any new uh, kin. Otherwise, you get the new kin by applying a fertility matrix uh, to, to the age distribution vector of some other kind of kin, K star uh, at age X. And you also need to specify an initial condition because this is a dynamical system and dynamical systems need initial conditions. So here we have the model for the dynamics of this kind of kin. At age X plus one, you get the kin by applying the survival matrix to age 
the kin at age X of focal, and then this vector of uh, recruits coming in. So this is a diagram that shows a piece of the kinship network surrounding focal. So here's focal here sitting here in the middle and focal has daughters who have granddaughters and great granddaughters. Focal has a mother and a grandmother, and great grandmother, and then uh, older sisters and younger sisters. Uh, these actually can be extended as far down and out and up as you like. And so this provides a framework for writing down the equations that we need to map the um, to map the the kinship network of focal. Here's the the core. This is the this is the center of it. Here's focal, her daughters, her mother, her older sisters, and her younger sisters. And I'm going to walk through the way that the equations are formulated uh, for these. Um, the rest of the network comes from just lifting this, these expressions up to further ranks of kin. So here come some equations. So let's start with daughters. I use the symbol A for these in the, in the uh, software that Diego is gonna talk about afterwards. Uh, he adopts different and somewhat more um, uh, intuitive symbols for the, for the different kin. So what's the initial condition for the daughters of Focal? It's zero. We know that when Focal is born, she has no daughters. What's the subsidy? What's the recruitment input? Well, new daughters are the result of reproduction by Focal herself. So we apply the, at age X, we apply the fertility matrix to a vector which has a one at age X, that's Focal. And that gives us the new daughters that she gets at age X. So here's the equation for the dynamics. And here's the initial condition up here. Easy, right? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. How about Focal's mother? So what's the initial condition? When Focal is born, she has exactly one mother. We pretty much know that fact, but we don't know the age of Focal's mother. What we do know is we know the distribution of the ages of newborn children in the population. That's this distribution that I've called pi, this vector. And so the initial condition for Focal's mother is basically that distribution of the ages of, uh, of mothers at the birth of children. How about the recruitment subsidy? Well, I'm gonna sidestep and ignore and postpone until some future date dealing with stepmothers or uh, situations like that. So Focal does not get any new mothers. Focal has one mother and that's it. So the recruitment term is zero. And here's the expression that projects the population of Focal's mother. Uh, let's see, how about Focal's younger sisters? Um, when Focal is born, she can't have any younger sisters because she's just been born. So the initial condition is zero. Oops, jumping around here. Um, Focal can get new younger sisters if her mother has children. So the recruitment of new younger sisters is a you get by applying the fertility matrix to the age distribution vector of mothers. So here's the model for the younger sisters of Focal. The older sisters of Focal. So when Focal is born, she can have older sisters. That's okay. The older sisters of Focal at the time she's born are the children that's vector A of Focal's mother, whose age we don't know, but we know its distribution. So we take a mixture of the 
age vectors of children. And that gives us the initial vector at Focal's birth of her older sisters. The recruitment subsidy is zero. Focal can't get any more older sisters after she's born because any sisters that arrive after she's born will be younger than she is. So here's the dynamics for the older sisters. So you, you march through this entire uh, kinship network uh, doing this kind of calculation. You can write the whole model down in a table. Here's all the different categories of kin that are in that diagram. Here's the initial condition. Here's the recruitment term for each of them. And so this gives you uh, analytical solutions for all of these uh, kin at every age of focal. Here's an example. I'm gonna, there's lots of, lots of examples in the papers that are written about this, but I wanna just show you what some of the results look like. This is a comparison of using the rates of Japan in 1947 and in 2014, life expectancy went up by 61% uh, from sort of mediocre range of 54 up to 87. Total fertility rate dropped by 70% going from 4.6 down to 1.4. Here's the numbers of the left graph daughters and the right graph granddaughters. So this is summing over all the ages of these granddaughters and granddaughters as a function of the age of focal on the X axis. Un and these are uh, period calculations. So it's under the 1947 rates, focal accumulated a lot of daughters and then they, focal reaches ages about 40 and then the number of daughters begins to go down because they're dying. Under 2014 rates, focal has daughters later, more slowly, much less, and they die off hardly at all. Granddaughters, the same thing, except it's delayed to get to another generation. Here's the granddaughters under 1947 rates. Here's the granddaughters under 2014 rates. Uh, this is mothers and grandmothers. I'm gonna skip over that. It's what you would expect. So I wanna talk about how to extend this. This gives a nice set of answers to the questions that it asks, but that's not all of the questions that you could ask. So I wanna talk about three of them. The other two here, I'm gonna skip over. There's papers about these. So prevalences in a very general sense, what happens when we try to account for both living and dead relatives? And one that I've just been working on, what happens when you try to put two sexes into the model? So if you know the age distribution of Focal's relatives and you know the prevalence of some condition, then you can calculate how many relatives with that condition does Focal have. This is the prevalence of dementia in Japanese women in 2015. It's exactly what you would expect. It doesn't start until late ages and it goes up very quickly. If you apply that to the results we saw for Japan, you get this. This is the number of mothers with dementia that uh, Focal will have at different ages under 1947 rates and 2014 rates. So in our contemporary world, Focal is way more likely to have a mother with dementia and a grandmother with dementia than was the case under rates some generations earlier. How about the dead? Here's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, notation wise, I'm gonna take this vector, I'm gonna write a little tilde over the top of it to indicate that it is a block structured vector. And in this case, the blocks represent the age vector, age distribution vector of the living relatives, 
and the dead relatives at any age of focal. And we're gonna have a U matrix and an F matrix that are also block structured. So what is the U matrix for that operates on this vector of living and dead kin? This part is the same matrix we had before, survival of the living relatives. This M is a mortality matrix. It describes the transitions from the living to the dead. This zero represents the dead coming back to life. And this zero means that we're throwing away the dead once it's happened. So this gives the deaths experienced at a given age. This matrix has the same structure, but with an identity matrix here, it keeps the dead. And so this gives the cumulative deaths of kin experienced by focal up to whatever age we're looking at. So if you're interested, these are two different ways of looking at deaths of kin and either one of them might be interesting to you, just requires changing this one piece of the matrix. The fertility matrix is easy. Here's F, same matrix as before, describing the reproduction of living kin by living kin and zeros everywhere else because the dead don't, uh, don't reproduce. This is, uh, this is result for daughters in Japan under these two different sets of rates. This is the death experienced. The red line is the 1947 rates, the blue line, the 2014 rates. Experiencing the death of a daughter under 2014 uh, rates is extraordinarily rare up until very late in Focal's life. It was way common under 1947 rates. This is the cumulative uh, deaths of daughters um, under those two rates. And you can see that Focal, in terms of the death of daughters and, and other, all the other kinds of kin too, uh, lived in a very different world under these rates than under the more recent rates. Uh, oops, how'd that get in here? This is, uh, not only is this a cool colorful graph, but this is results that I'm not gonna talk about when you incorporate parity structure as well as age structure into the model and the different colors represent different parities of daughters. No time for that. Let's talk about two sex models. Um, there's two reasons for wanting, well, three reasons for wanting to build a two sex version of this model. One is just the, if you don't, then you keep feeling like you ought to. Um, more, uh, more important maybe, uh, first of all, we know, everybody knows that male and female mortality schedules differ. Women typically live longer than men, almost every place that you look at them. And male and female fertility schedules differ. Um, this is an example from a, a recent paper by uh, a guy named Schumacher who um, looked at a lot of male and female fertility schedules. This left graph is for Senegal in 2013, and you have the fertility schedule for women and for men. Men can reproduce much later ages than women, and in high fertility countries, men typically have higher fertility schedules than women in the analysis that Schumacher did. This is France, 2012, a low fertility country. And in those situations, although males still reproduce somewhat later uh, than females, the, the schedules are much more similar to each other. So we'd like to be able to incorporate that. The other reason that we need a two sex model is to account for all of the kin. So the one sex version of this model has focal 
who produces daughters, her daughters produce daughters, those daughters produce daughters. Whereas in fact, what happens is that Focal produces daughters and sons and the daughters produce daughters and sons and the sons produce daughters and sons. And so just looking at the maternal line of descent, which is what the, the models uh, since Goodman, Kiefitz and Pullum have done, you lose out on a big chunk of the, of the kin. And so in fact, whoops, Goodman, Kiefitz, and Pullum uh, introduced, uh, they, they proposed um, an approximate solution to this, uh, which works, it turns out really well, where if you wanna know the children of Focal, if you imagine that men and women have the same rates, they're just indistinguishable from each other, then the number of children is two times the number of daughters, the number of grandchildren is four times the number of granddaughters through the maternal line and so on. And so there's a factor by which you can multiply uh, all of these um, different kinds of kin. Um, let's see. So we need to do this. Turns out that we can. Um, so now we need two survival matrices, one for females and one for males. So we incorporate the male and female mortality schedules into these. And we need two fertility matrices, one for female fertility and one for male fertility. We need two age distributions, distribution of ages at maternity and that should be paternity. Uh, and we also need the sex ratio at birth, the proportion of uh, typically measured as the proportion of males uh, among births. And now we have a model for some type of kin. We have the female and the male eight kin age structures. We make a block structured vector. We have a block structured matrix. We have a block structured recruitment term. How are we gonna build these matrices? So this is the one sex version of the model. This is the two sex version of the model where uh, Focal gives birth to daughters and sons, which give birth to granddaughters and grandsons, which give birth to great granddaughters and great grandsons. When we go up, the network and look at Focal's ancestors, we get uh, parents and then we get grandparents. The reproduction by the descendants of Focal is independent in the sense that Focal's daughters and Focal's sons reproduce independently of each other to produce granddaughters and grandsons. But Focal's parents don't reproduce independently of each other to produce Focal's siblings. Um, so you have to assign the reproduction to one or the other of them. I did the usual female dominant calculation so that Focal's older brothers, older sisters and older brothers, younger sisters and younger brothers are produced by Focal's mother, according to the female fertility schedule. And you end up with the expression that we've seen before. This is the block structured vector. Here's the <clears throat> Here's the matrix with the survival of females and males. And then here's the recruitment term, which is either zero or is obtained by applying the fertility matrix to some other kind of kin. The fertility matrix is either 
for ancestors, the female fertility matrix applied to the female ancestors <coughs> or the female and the male fertility matrices applied to both female and male individuals in anything other than direct ancestors. And alpha and alpha bar are just alpha and one minus alpha, the proportion of female and male uh, offspring. So I, I used the um, data from Schumacher's paper for Senegal. We saw France, Haiti. Uh, he also looked at is sort of in the middle between these. Um, very different total fertility rates for females, for males, uh, different, different uh, mean ages at maternity and paternity, uh, typical uh, differences much greater in France than in Senegal of, <laughs> of uh, life expectancy at birth. And so we construct the matrices, put them into the model that I just showed you, and we get all kinds of cool results. This is the numbers of children as a function of the age of focal, Senegal, Haiti, France. The blue area is female children. The red area is male children. This is grandchildren. Uh, the magnitude of these uh, curves is exactly what you would expect uh, from countries with different total fertility rates, fertility levels. If you look closely at these, you can see that it appears that the relative proportions of male and female can change. And sure enough, if you calculate the sex ratio, um, the proportion of males in these different categories, uh, they go down with the age of focal. Uh, this is for parents. By the time Focal is old, her father is most likely dead, but her mother might still be alive. <laughs> Even more so for grandparents and great grandparents. And so you can go through that entire kinship network and calculate the uh, a lot of sex specific prevalences. Uh, there are lots of diseases that have very different prevalences between men and women. Um, sociological variables like income. Uh, there's a well-known gender gap in income. Uh, this opens up the ability to calculate all of those things for different kinds of kin. And to finish up, um, this, is the, this is the basic pieces of the two sex model. A female and male mortality schedule and female and male fertility schedules. Suppose you don't have all of that. Maybe you have only one mortality schedule, or maybe more likely, you have two mortality schedules, but you only have one fertility schedule. Well, you can clearly, you can approximate things by just plugging in the schedules that you have. What I refer to as the androgynous approximation is when you only have one mortality schedule and one fertility schedule, and you treat males and females as being the same, being indistinguishable from each other, so usually you would have female rates. And so this would be the female mortality schedules and the female fertility schedules. And I did this exercise, this is for Senegal where the differences in fertility 
are really big. And this is for children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, parents, grandparents, great grandparents. And uh, for female and male kin, comparing the full two sex model, because we have the rates for them with, the, with this androgynous approximation. And it surprised me that the agreement was that good. The difference is way less than one relative uh, between these. So uh, using the two sex model in this way when in cases where you aren't lucky enough to have full male and female uh, rates looks like it's likely to be pretty successful uh, even for a population with big differences in fertility. So the last thing I wanna say is this. This is the one sex model. This is the multi-type model, which I didn't uh, talk about, but it's got a block structured vectors. This is the time varying uh, model in which rates change over time. This is the two sex model, again, a block structured matrix. They all have the same form. Why do we call it formal demography? If you look at our pictures on the screen, we're not a particularly formal bunch of people. I think one of the reasons we call it formal demography uh, is analogous to why they call formal logic, formal logic. Formal logic refers to analysis of logical propositions that are true or false on the basis of their form, regardless of their content. The Euler-Lotka equation that's on the little logo of this group is true for any population. It's a formal statement of the relationship between LX, MX, and little r. Um, any time that you find yourself able to analyze such different structures as this and have the form come out the same uh, is for somebody that does formal demography is really satisfying. Okay, summary thoughts. Kin of focal are a population. We can analyze all kinds of things. We can compute them easily. I use MATLAB. It's a matrix-oriented programming language. Um, R is not quite as matrix-oriented, but it's popular and it's available. And there's a package created by Diego and colleagues that uh, has a presentation coming up. I think I'm done. Yes, I am done. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see people again. Thanks very much, Hal. That's great. Um, before we get on to Diego, does anyone have any brief brief questions or comments that they would like to share? I have a, I have a question, Gustav Feichtinger. Is it possible to pose a question to Hal? Yes. Uh, Hal, uh, well, first uh, one, um, uh, one uh, um, short question. Why is the total fertility rate or the area under the fertility schedule of males in Senegal or in these countries in Black Africa so different from the, or even different from the females? Because they have females and males get, get children. Uh, is it a logical misconclusion? that they should have the same amount of children? I don't know. <laughs> that's, my, that's my short answer to it. Um, uh, Could I say something? This is Tom Pullum. Yeah. Yeah, so I work with the world, for, I mean with uh, the demographic and health surveys. And uh, um, 
Gustav, I, I think it's because the males have much higher mortality. And we often uh, overlook this assumption about uh, the total fertility rate that the, uh, the woman, or in this case, the man is surviving the full uh, 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 reproductive age range. And that's um, not necessarily the case. And I, I believe that um, the fact that uh, mortality is much higher for males than for females in Senegal is what's, what's working on, working um, behind the... And this leads to such a high difference that they have a total fertility rate, if I remember correctly, of 11 of, of males in, the, in this table uh, was shown by, by Hill. I'd have to check that. Yeah, uh, but I have a second question, which is maybe uh, uh, equally or even more important. Uh, I like your approach very much, and I, I really agree with what you said. This is logically not only the presentation uh, was uh, so 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 under could understand easily, but it's so logical a, a, a nice framework and so on. But this is a dynamical system, as you said before that. And all these dynamical systems in your case, multi type and so on have the same structure. And one of the core questions in dynamical systems theory is to look at the asymptotic behavior on that. And does it make sense here also to study this? I've, I've thought about this question. Um, I, think that, I think that it is possible um, in once in, a, in the usual way that we think about these um, uh, these models, it, the question is, suppose focal is, a, let's say, female of alive at this age. And therefore, it doesn't make sense to run that calculation out asymptotically. But you don't have to put the clause in there about focal being alive. So think of someone like Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria died in 1901 or something. Uh, she stopped having children, but her children didn't stop. And so the network of kin keeps going um, in time since the birth of Focal rather than just thinking of the age of Focal. And doing something like that might let you, uh, might let you ask asymptotic questions Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks for your question, Gustav. So Ian had a question as well? Um, no, I just wanted to comment on the difference between male and female fertility in Senegal. Um, clearly the male population and the female population have to grow at the same rate in the long term. And so what balances it is the mean length of generation. If you think of the equation relating the growth rate to, to, to net reproduction rate and the mean length of generation. Uh, broadly, if, if men have 50% uh, uh, higher total fertility than women, they also have a 50% longer mean length of generation. That brings everything back into balance. So that's how that's working in, in, in terms of Lotka's formulations. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. I think we'll just move on to Diego's uh, now, just before we run out of time. But thanks, everyone, for the great discussion. Yes. Uh, hi, Monica. And um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks, uh, Vanessa, Rio, and, uh, and Monica for the uh, invitation. And um, so it, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. And uh, we don't have so much time, so I'll just say that. Uh, uh, so this is uh, so I'll, I'll present some sort of implementations that we uh, have been working on with my colleague Ivan Williams, who is here. And we were kind of uh, we're big, uh, very, very excited by these kinship models in general and by Hal's uh, application in particular. So we were so excited that we thought more people should have uh, sort of an easy access to to these uh, models. And uh, with this, we created a, a package for R, 
um, that uh, kind of uh, is an out of the box implementation of uh, some of these models. So you can think of this like fan fiction, uh, except that now uh, Hal and also uh, Shisam, who is in the call, uh, are uh, part of the project. So, so we're very happy about this. And um, so I just want to show you very right. And in case you didn't get the email, okay, yeah. So that's the that's the link to this uh, to this handout. And I'm not going to go through everything, uh, but I wrote it for this presentation. So if you have the time and you're, if you're interested in running some of these things on your own, you can go through it later. The, the package is uh, uh, written for R and it is available from GitHub. So you can just uh, install it as you normally would. And, the, and basically, if you're interested in running this uh, matrix uh, kinship models, there is one simple function that is called kin. And uh, this takes uh, like the basic uh, sort of uh, arguments that it, that it takes is a matrix of survival ratios, a, a matrix of fertility rates. And then it, there is an argument if you want to assume that the population is stable or if you want to take time variant rates. And there are some other things that, um, that allow you to estimate to, to, to compute this uh, kinship networks uh, under different uh, conditions. And the so this is what Hal mentioned. The so depending on the type of relative that you're interested in, uh, the, we use these codes, which are different from the ones that uh, Hal uses, but uh, maybe more intuitive for someone who uses this uh, for the first time. And kind of to make things easier for people who are doing this the first time, we uh, included some data in the package uh, from Sweden. So you don't need to do anything else. You can just run like a quick demo. And the data that we included are uh, survival ratios by age um, for Sweden. So this is kind of what this looks like. We also included fertility data, uh, so fertility rates and, uh, and population data. Uh, as well, it's coming from the human fertility and mortality database. And I'm just gonna give you a sense of uh, kind of what you can do with this package. So using the this uh, demonstration data for Sweden, we can, uh, if we run this function kin, then we get an, an object, which is a list. And, um, and there is a function that does this uh, sort of uh, kinship key key style kinship diagrams. So in this case, this is a, a woman, an average woman in Sweden, age 35, who was exposed to the 1950 uh, fertility and mortality rates. And this is sort of a snapshot of the expected number of relatives that this person would have. Um, call her, uh, uh, well, here it says ego, but um, it, this is what the Hal calls uh, focal. And uh, so this is the expected number of daughters, granddaughters, and um, uh, younger sisters, older sisters. Right, so this is all contained in the function. And um, you can also get this uh, sort of distribution, distributions over age, but I'll just maybe jump to some more intuitive results. Like we may be interested in uh, family size. Like what, what is the average family size of a person over their, their life course? So here, this is the expected number of living uh, female relatives for a person uh, over focus age. And we can also see the distribution by type of relative, right? So we see how sort of the composition, even though the number kind of states doesn't change so much, the composition like, changes uh, dramatically. Um, and we also have an implementation for the death of kin. So this, for example, is the expected number of kin deaths that a person would experience at each age. And this is sort of like how that, they had, that is composed. And um, the cumulative number of deaths that a person surviving to each age experiences is over here and sort of broken down by type of, uh, of relative. Um, yes, so there's much more. This is assuming a stable population, but uh, you, we also have uh, uh, the option to, to not assume a stable population, but actually have population with changing rates. And there is also some data built into the package that, um, that you can use uh, to kind of see how that works. So these are like the different parameters that Hal mentioned in his presentation. Uh, so the distribution of mothers, uh, the proportion of births that are male, 
and um, so with this you, you can kind of reproduce the so, sort of everything that uh, that is in house papers so in, in two papers so the one on stable and the non-stable populations and you can do this from a cohort perspective so there are like a number of things that we still want to implement but uh, we are also happy to welcome people into the project. Uh, if you're interested in participating, uh, then just uh, please get in touch. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, ongoing work. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Diego. Um, does anyone have any questions about the our package comments. I think it's just great that we can, it's so powerful that we can go and just play around with this stuff. Uh, any questions about the R package? Any other questions? More broadly? Make a point. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the things that um, so uh, Diego kind of uh, zipped over, but the uh, there was also a question uh, in the in the chat about time varying rates, and um, so there is a version of the model that allows the rates to vary, and and Diego showed. Uh, where that fits into the package. One of the things that um, I had not thought of until I did that <clears throat> is that uh, we have two sources of time varying rates for populations. One is historical and the other is fortune telling. That is pretty much every country produces projections of future time varying rates for their country under some kind of a scenario of projecting mortality and fertility schedules. <clears throat> and this uh, allows you to do not only historical sequences, but to make kinship calculations part of the output of standard population projections that, like I say, pretty much every country uh, produces these. So sort of opens up a, an extra, uh, variable for looking at for uh, population projections. So I, I can just add something to that. So one of the things that we are also thinking of doing with, uh, with Ivan is providing like functions that would make it easy for people to take data from the United Nations World Population Prospect, for example, to just like import that data and get like expected uh, sort of uh, kinship dis distributions from from that and also from HFD and the uh, HFD. I have a question if no one else does. Um, I guess it's more broadly about these matrix models and thinking about variance. Um, so I, I guess maybe maybe it's a question asked in the second paper because I think it's to do with parity distributions perhaps. But thinking about, we've got a pretty good idea of the expected number of uh, different types of kin from these models, but would it be possible to sort of think about incorporating variants due to parity distributions or other types of variants? Immortality, for example. So uh, I'm not quite clear what you mean, what uh, variants of what? Um, so variances have to come from someplace. Yeah, so I guess maybe thinking about um, uh, 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 so the number of sisters, for example. So isn't that going to depend on the very like the parity distribution of um, 
the, the sort of variation in, in fertility for a particular woman at a particular point in time? So not just the fertility rates, but also the variance in well, the fertility rates? So, may, I, may I give maybe an interpretation of your question uh, and concerning uh, Hale's question on that issue? Maybe you mean what in the book of John Pollard and also in the paper by papers by Nathan Kiefitz, I think it was in Biometrica and by Leo Goodman on these Leslie models that they were considered not only as Leslie invented this deterministic model, other than as a stochastic model. And then he calculated the variances and the covariances on that issue. Uh, do you mean this maybe in, in, in that sense or, uh, or okay. do you mean it differently? So that's, that's, one, that's one version of, of variances, but I think the question is a, is a little bit different um, because the, um, so when you write down an analysis with a mortality schedule and a fertility schedule as functions, let's say of age, you're saying nothing else matters. There isn't anything else, because if there was, you would have had to put it into the calculations. So parity is an example of something that matters. And so you can put that in. Um, the human fertility database has uh, parity specific fertility information in it. And then what you have is a model where individuals are, <clears throat> are characterized by their age and their parity. And that influences the, the kinship structure. And you can map, you can follow how, uh, there was one multicolored graph that I had in my presentation that I hadn't realized I had left in there, but basically comparing over, some decades, you see big changes in the parity distribution of the relatives of focal as uh, women have fewer children and have them at different, uh, at different ages. So to get that kind of information, then you need, you need to actually put that into the analysis. What Gustav is referring to uh, is a different source of variance, which is you know, uh, survival probability is a probability. And so sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. These are small populations. The, the size of the population of, the, of some relative of focal is not very big. And so that kind of stochasticity can have, uh, can have lots of effects. Uh, Tom Pullum has uh, looked at quite some time ago now, uh, the possibility of connecting it to branching process theory, which is designed to look at the variance of those uh, kinds of things. I'm working on trying to get some other kinds of stochastic solutions to be able to quantify that variance. Um, yeah, thanks. I think uh, in my head, there were two questions, both of which have partly been answered. Um, I get, and I guess sort of linking uh, the, the the second type of variance that you were talking about to, to simulation models, because we can get an idea of that sort of variation using, using the sort of SOXIM approach, right? Um, for a smaller populations, because we get, we are getting a whole population and so we can look at the mean and the mean and the standard deviation of, of different outcomes. Yeah. Um, but uh, thanks, thanks for those responses. Any other questions before we um, head off? Oh, yep. Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure who was first. Yeah, Kido. Yeah, Kido. Kido has uh, made questions before. Please just okay. I just make the thank, thanks, Diego, and and how um, I just had a. Uh, I was just wondering, would it be possible to include fosterage or orphans? into these models. Um, I'm thinking specifically in context where 
we have limited data for certain settings, but we know there's some fostering or orphans that are being um, carried through in these households. Would there be ways to incorporate this in the model? Um, that's a, a really good. That's a really good question. Um, I'm aware of the fact that this whole tradition of modeling kinship uh, takes a very um, sort of basic approach to it. And there's a lot of things that um, it doesn't address. And that's, and, and you've pointed to a couple of them, uh, step relatives, uh, blended families, uh, all of the different kinds of things that have changed a lot in family structures in recent years, decades, um, aren't in here yet. My answer to the question, can it be incorporated is always yes. It just is gonna take some ingenuity to do it. Um, uh, being born and dying, which are the two processes that are in the, the model. Um, those are really definite things, and we know a lot about how to measure rates of being born and rates of dying. Uh, we know less about how to measure rates of foster uh, families or things like that. So open problems. Can, can I just add quickly, I, I think your question was also raises this point of like why we care about kinship, right? And sort of these models give us like a, like a very biological and to a certain extent limited view of like what people may consider like as families. And uh, so like they give you like the structure of the network, but they say nothing about the, the function, right? Which is like why. Uh, I think, well, like in my work, I think combining this with like other approaches can give you like this more like holistic uh, uh, overview. Thanks, Jenna. Great, thanks for these fantastic presentations and for doing all the work to make DemoCan accessible, um, Diego and colleagues. I uh, am curious about, when I see applications of, the, of this, I, it's often we're creating people and then uh, allocating attributes of people based on their age and gender. So for example, how many kin will have dementia, right? That's a fantastic example. Um, you know, is anyone working on this in a multi-state framework where people acquire attributes and move through life or? Yeah, uh, so that, that, I don't know if anyone's working in that area. There's a great reference there. The best, uh, the best example, I, best examples I know of that and just because of what I tend to look at um, uh, is in health demography uh, where, um, people build models where, uh, and I have a, a paper that also came out last year in demographic research, looking at using as an example, a model that was published a while ago for uh, colon cancer with like seven different stages of the disease and individuals can pass through that, those stages and eventually die either from cancer or from some other cause the rates depend on age. And so you end up with a multi-state model that uh, maps out the pathways that individuals can follow through their lives with, with that kind of health um, information. And so hasn't there, been, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, hasn't been applied to um, uh, kinship calculations. Yeah. That um, that's what I was curious about is that, you know, you're, you're building these, these kin who are created and then uh, uh, acquire attributes at different ages. Um, okay, great. Thanks very much. Any more questions? I mean, best time, but maybe another quick one. The discussion is so good. <laughs> so 
if you had to if you would win a billion dollars now to sell why kinship is important for for demography what would you say <laughs> no we're just joking because there was this other uh, advertisement of other talks and um so since it's something that it's just so important but sometimes not sometimes not used and there are so many applications if you could just uh, give a few words on that why why kinship is important in demography uh so my i'll give my answer diego can give his answer my answer to that is think about it the two most basic processes in demography are birth and death everybody's born everybody's going to die many people are going to give birth are going to have uh, offspring and so there's no surprise that we have a really big rich theoretical mathematical framework for analyzing birth and death in demography and how those relate to population growth and all the rest of it those are the two biggest the two most fundamental things what's the third i would claim that the third is family humans are a species that cannot live without family or some uh you know, it's really terrible things that happen when we try to substitute things for family and so understanding the dynamics of relatives is part of understanding the dynamics of families it's not like diego was saying and uh we both watched a seminar yesterday uh to this effect it's not it's not the whole story but it provides a framework in which you can begin to ask lots of questions about how families work yeah and i'll just add that, yeah i mean that, that that's a, a great answer and uh so i would just add that also at this seminar yesterday it was uh, frank Rosenberg. uh um there was this point that came up which is that for some reason, and we can kind of trace the genealogy of this idea, but there is this idea that families kind of be, have become and may become like less and less relevant in like modern societies. And, um, and I think that's incorrect. Like I, I think that like the importance of, or that the family is somehow just like the people who live with you in, your, in the household. And um, I think that's incorrect. I think that families are extremely important and will continue to be so in the future. So we might as well kind of start paying more attention to the, to the processes uh, through which they come to being and uh, the relevance that they have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, one more question, Jim. Uh, I, there's a really interesting uh, maybe linked to cancer uh, with this model that there's some evidence that that eternal age relates to the telomere length, the end of the of the uh, DNA, and that telomere length then also relates to incidence of cancer. So it seems to me that it would be the system you have would be very easy to to connect telomere or identify telomere length with paternal age, which the, the older the father, the longer the telomere length, and then link that to cancer. There's a, there's a paper that came out, oh, in 2018, paternal age and transgenerational telomere lengths, paternal age and transgenerational telomere lengths maintenance, a simulation model. And I think that would be really interesting to to take what you've done and, and then look at if you can predict or see what would be the effect of this transfer of paternal age on, on health properties of uh, the offspring. Might be a low hanging fruit right there. It would be really interesting and the, and the model would produce the information you would need yeah. to be able to track paternal age uh, of offspring would just be another dimension 
to add to the model. I'm collaborating with a group in Woods Hole in the United States uh, that's analyzing maternal age effects in rotifers as a model organism. Uh, these are um, asexually reproducing, so it's always it's, it's mother's mm -hmm. age, and it has big effects on survival and fertility of the of the offspring. Well, I'm glad you guys have done all the hard work on this because it's, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, if there's nothing else, then I think we should uh, uh, end today's meeting. Thanks very much for uh, everyone coming and thanks very much for Hal and Diego for the fantastic presentations. I thought this was a wonderful session. Um, I will put any links up uh, to, uh, to recordings and materials on the website. Uh, and other than that, see you next month to the next Great. meeting. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for listening thank and you questions. So much. And thank, thank you, you to the Thank you to the organizers of this group. This is great to have an opportunity yeah. to talk to people that like formal demography. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.